Hey everyone, I'm going to be telling you about supernovae today and how we can use them to estimate distances in the universe. So if you go on the previous video where I'm talking about spectral classes of t stars and then the life of different stars, you know that um, two ways of t stars dying is one by a type 1 supernovae and one for the type 2. So go there so you know, you know what is the background of this video. So I'm going just to tell you about two types now, the type 1 and 2. There is uh, subclasses within the types, but I'm just going to say about them generally. So the type 1 is when I have something like a white dwarf, which is, um, for example, the death of our sun. Um, when it dies, it becomes a white dwarf later on. So that white dwarf does have a companion, so he's in a binary, and is going to be, because it's so dense, he's going to accrete the mass, so he's going to get the mass from uh, the companion star, and when, once it reaches a certain limit, which I'm going to tell you in a second, so once it reaches 1.44 solar masses, it gets to a critical state, the critical mass, it uh, gets unstable, and it explodes. That's a type 1 supernova. Now, the light curves exhibit a very short maxima, so suddenly is very, very bright, and then gradually dies away, okay? Um, and the peak magnitude, so that sharp maxima, the peak magnitude is going to be of about minus 19.3, which is quite high, okay? Um, so, for example, the sun's um, real magnitude, so the absolute magnitude, which is uh, what I'm talking about now, is about 5, is 4.77. So a peak magnitude of minus 19.3 is an enormous magnitude, because as you know, the lower the number, uh, meaning more negative numbers, even mean a brighter um, star, in this case, brighter explosion, okay? And this peak magnitude stays for about 20 days. So here we go, type 1 supernova, I have a big peak in the magnitude. Actually, I just realized something in here. Anyway, uh, it has a very um, a peak magnitude up here, and then it stays for a little bit longer, okay? And here we go as well. Now, the type 2 is when I have a massive star, a star that is maybe 10, 8, 10, even more um, solar masses. And um, when it runs out of fuel, um, actually, it doesn't run out of fuel. It, it keeps doing... Um, fuel and, uh, sorry, it keeps doing fuel, <laughs> he keeps doing fusa, a fusion into heavier elements up to when he gets to iron, iron, uh, when it fuses into iron, this takes energy away from the star, and then it cannot balance, um, it cannot get enough uh, heat to make enough pressure to balance the gravity that is trying to contract the star, and it collapses, and that's a type 2 supernova. Again, go on the previous video so you know what I'm talking about. Now, these ones, they have a less sharp peak at maxima, so they are not so bright visually, okay, um, in terms of absolute magnitude, and they die away more sharply than the type 1. So here we go, for example, a type 2, not so bright in the peak, and then it dies away more sharply in the beginning. I just realized that this other graph shows the type 2 a little bit higher up in terms of the peak maxima, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes you try to find these pictures in the internet and then they don't quite give you exactly what you want, and sometimes they do have mistakes and you only realize it after. So the type 2 is actually not as bright, okay? Now, just for you to have an idea, supernova may shine with a brightness of 10 billion suns, and the total energy is going to be more or less for uh, 10 to the power of 44 joules, which is actually the total output of the sun during the whole lifetime, which is about 10 billion years, okay? So this is for you to have an idea of how dramatic and how strong these explosions are, okay? Now, more stuff about type 1 and type 2 supernova. So the type 1 supernova is when it comes from a white dwarf, okay? The white dwarf um, is only staying there, so it's not contracting any more due to something that is called the electron degeneracy force. So the electrons, they are opposite charges, they don't like each other. So the pressure that they do with themselves by repelling each other at the very center, at the core of the star, is enough to make the, the, a stable object. But it's a very tiny object, so it's a dwarf star, is white because it still radiates energy, okay? So that's the white dwarf. 
Now, if the dwarf, draw, if the white dwarf does have a companion, then it's going to accrete, so it's going to uh, get material from the other companion, okay? And once it gets to a limit, which is 1.44 solar masses, this is going to be the critical mass, also known as the Chandrasekhar limit, okay? So, this is what we know. Now, the, in terms of evidence, when we look at the spectra, we see that the type 1 supernova uh, is, is very poor in hydrogen, okay? And that is consistent to what we believe that makes a white dwarf, because a white dwarf is not supposed to have hydrogen. A white dwarf is made or is created after the sun runs out of hydrogen because he, or a few, um, he made a fusion of all the hydrogen or most of it into helium and it does not have enough heat to make the helium to fusion to carbon and that's when the pressure cannot balance gravity anymore and the gra gravity starts to contract the star. This is, you know, and then you do get the planetary nebula. Again, go on the other video, okay? Now, the smooth decay of the light is also consistent with the model, the models that we have for what would happen when we have an explosion of a white dwarf. Uh, since most of the energy output would be from the radioactive decay of the unstable heavy elements that are produced in the explosion. So it does make sense, okay? Our models are all right. For the type 2 supernova, this is when uh, I have an implosion explosion, so a complete collapse, and this causes an explosion um, of a massive star. Okay, and then uh, they they suddenly go very flat in the light curves. Okay, a few months after the actual supernova. Okay, and this is um, this plateau can be seen as well in um, computer models that assume that the energy comes from the expansion and the cooling of the star's outer envelope, so the outer layer. Okay, as it's blown away into space. So again, this makes sense. The observation with our models. Okay. Also, I see strong hydrogen and helium spectra for the type 2 supernova, which is a contrast to the type 1. And again, this makes sense because the type 2 supernova is a star that is so massive that it's still doing, it has so much mass, so it has so much hydrogen inside that it still has hydrogen fusing into helium and helium into carbon. Um, when the other heavier elements are fusing, so oxygen, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and uh, getting to the fusion of iron and when it gets to that iron uh, the star still has hydrogen and helium but the star is not stable anymore and that's why it collapses and dies okay so it makes sense that we have hydrogen and helium in a spectrum and then there should be a lot of these gases in the extreme outer regions of the massive, uh, massive star as well okay because again the fusion is still happening so I can use supernova to estimate distances. I had here a video, but honestly, this video is not working anymore, it's unavailable. Uh, so I'm not going to put the link for this video. But really, what the video would say is, because the type 1a supernova always happens because of the same process, where the white dwarf is accreting uh, material from the companion star, the explosions all happen at the same time once the mass is the, gets to the Chandra uh, Sekhar limit, so 1.44 solar masses, and therefore all explosions have the same magnitude. So I can use supernova to estimate distances because I know the absolute magnitudes of the explosion and I can compare it with the apparent magnitude, which is how bright it seems from Earth. And then I just need to use these equations, okay? Apparent magnitude minus the absolute magnitude equals 5 logarithm of this function plus 25. That's the function. And the z is this one in here, okay? Uh, which is part here, is here on the function, okay? So I use that formula. Uh, obviously, the computer is going to kind of uh, figure out what the answers are as I put the parameters. I'm not doing this by hand, but I can use this formula to estimate distances, okay? So the supernova are actually the most reliable measurements that I have for cosmological distances. For distances, they are both um, 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 megaparsec. So 
small distances like solar system I can use radar go on that video bigger distances within nearby stars I can use parallax again go on that video but then after a certain distance I cannot use parallax and I can use cannot use radar anymore so I need to use something else and type 1 a supernova is really the most reliable way that we have at the moment okay however although they are reliable they are still not perfect and I'll go there in a second so I can have two models of type 1a supernova to estimate the distances one is when I have a white dwarf and the other in a binary, any binary star. Again, I get to the Ch uh, Chandrasekhar limit of 1.44 solar masses, and I have the collapse in the supernova. The other model that I can do in a computers, and again, matches with the observations, I can have, again, a binary system. I have a white dwarf and either another white dwarf or a neutron star. Again, I do get the... Chandra Secker limit of 1.44 solar masses and this is when the star explodes, okay? Now, this is sometimes called the double degeneracy or double de uh, degenerate model because my white dwarf is, um, is there because of the electron degeneracy force, so the electrons don't like each other. The neutron star is a star that is even more dense and it was comp compressed even further so what happened to that star is um, it was compressed so much that the electrons even combined with the protons and my neutrons and the neutrons do happen to repel each other as well and this creates that pressure that makes that the star doesn't collapse flat like for example a black hole okay so I have these two models and as I told you they work okay they work fine because I always get this, uh, the, the same critical mass I always have the same limit of 1.44 solar masses so it's all working well in terms for me to do the, um, um, the estimating distances sometimes I need to um, get a, a little bit of an approximation because the energy output for the detonation so the explosion is not quite always the same okay so it's not quite the same but I can still do some approximations because really that's the only thing I can do there is nothing better for me at the moment to estimate these distances okay so the distances uncertainties for the type 1a supernova are about 5% okay um, and this is when I have a difference in magnitude of 0.1 okay so that's what I can use now I'm just going to tell you one more thing which is there's something else that we don't take in consideration or we try to but we can't take in consideration completely when we are estimating distances reality is okay that's all the physics and that's the best that we have at the moment but there is this dark energy now dark energy is kind of a force or it acts like a force a little bit like anti-gravity so instead of getting things to get closer together and attracting to each other the dark energy is actually making the universe um, um, spreading outward so it's making the universe to accelerate and everything is moving away from each other okay now we know the universe is accelerating but the universe is accelerating at a faster rate, according to our last data, a faster rate that we expected and that we first measured. So some scientists say, can we really use supernova to estimate the distances? And now we'll leave you here. I'm going to tell you um, about other ways to estimate larger distances in another video, but so on, I'm, or so far, or for now, I'm going to leave you here thinking about this problem, and maybe you are going to find a solution. So, take care, let me just pause this video, take care, and I'll see you in the next video, bye!